All things considered, I knew I was among the lucky ones. Regardless of anything that might have gone wrong before or after, I did wake up after 96 years of cryosleep. The same couldn't be said for all the volunteers. Everything started over a hundred years ago. The state of planet Earth was critical, and people were finally taking seriously the threat of human extinction. The result was absolute panic. A handful of spaceships left the planet in hopes of finding somewhere else to live or to hide in outer space, while the Earth fixed itself. As expected, not everyone managed to get a place on those ships. Powerful people coped by starting wars. Hopeless people coped with mass suicide. And a small group thought it was a good idea to have a contingency plan so humanity wouldn't disappear forever. In case the world would recover, in case one of the spaceships ever came back for survivors, in case of whatever miracle, we needed to make sure there would still be some of us asleep, safe, and waiting. This was the start of the Cryosleep Project. It was a very big and ambitious business. Many countries attempted their own version of it, and many religions called it blasphemy. It caused a lot of controversy. Nevertheless, the project gained traction until it was eventually completed. They guaranteed us that they had run enough tests and that it was completely safe. Sure, there was a tiny margin for error, and sure, they worked on it in a hurry and pressured by money and imminent death, but it was totally safe, they said. The thing is, it was very, very tempting. They offered a ridiculous amount of money to the family you left behind, and to you in a hundred years when you woke up. It was obviously a way to target desperate people and get them to join their experiment. Not that it meant rich people didn't join. There were a couple of politicians that were probably forced to join to vouch for the project. There were also so many celebrities desperate for attention and immortality that they had to put a limit on how many they accepted. But mostly, it was an endless list of underprivileged and hopeless people that would be picked at random. Unfortunately for me, I was one of those wretched souls. Sure, if the world ended, money wouldn't matter, but I had plenty of siblings, aunts, cousins, and relatives that, at the very least, could use the money to live their last years comfortably. I would die for any and all of them. In a way, that's exactly what I did. There were medical tests, psychological tests, background checks, and as much preparation as they could afford in as little time as possible. There were a hundred of us, meant to sleep for a hundred years. Fifty men and fifty women, ages between 18 and 60, with the majority, like me, in their 20s or 30s. Diversity of religions, ethnicities, and languages, except for the 20 spots used by politicians and celebrities, they chose a wide range of skills and professions. Doctors, nurses, engineers, mechanics, cooks, agriculture specialists, and plenty of young and healthy people that could do hard work in case we really woke up in a barren land and were responsible for rebuilding society. For better or for worse, that wasn't the case. I remember my last day. I remember saying goodbye to my family. Half of them celebrated me like a hero, and half of them cried and swore they'd try to forgive me for abandoning them. I remember going with all the volunteers into a building and being led towards the basement, supposedly the safest place in the world. I remember signing one last piece of paper saying that I was doing this willingly and then getting inside of my very own cryosleep chamber, lined along the almost endless wall. And then, there was a melodic, but inevitably ominous alarm. There was a sudden cold, not freezing or painful, but inescapable. And finally, full and absolute darkness. Until now, 
I woke up slowly, at first, just as they said we would. Then suddenly, with a painful shock of life and electricity coursing through my body. Nobody had prepared us for that. I tried to scream, and I'm not even sure if I managed it. My throat burned, but the sound didn't quite register yet. I tried to fight for my life, to get out of that unnatural coffin by whatever means necessary, but I wasn't even sure what I was doing. My body was violently shaking, and I tried to throw myself at the walls around me. I tried to punch and kick my way out of the slumber, out of the cryosleep chamber, out of my own body if I could. I was a prisoner. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't do anything. Until finally, the cover of the cryosleep vessel slid open and I was able to stumble outside of it, gasping for breath and overwhelmed by my own senses like a newborn baby. Someone, a nurse I think, caught me in her arms before I could hit the floor. At first, everything around me was blurry. Everything touching me was sharp and painful, and the sounds came at me as if I was underwater. My heart was beating frantically, and my trembling hands grasped at anything that could offer me a semblance of stability. But finally, my senses started to adjust. Although my sight was blurry, the sterile and mute colors of the laboratory were somewhat calming. A woman's hands ran soothingly down my back, and I could hear her voice saying, It's okay. You'll be okay. My name is Nurse Lucy Holland. I got you. There was an emergency, but it's all okay. You'll be okay. She repeatedly consoled me until the very act of breathing stopped feeling like it was killing me. I was alive. I was awake. The cryosleep project succeeded. And I survived. The realization enveloped me like a warm blanket against the tremendous shock I had just experienced. I started to feel like time was slowing down to something more manageable. The woman who caught me had to repeat her name several times, but when I started to trust my brain again, I promised I would never forget her name. So, when she helped me sit at an examination table and started to take my vital signs, the first thing I said was, Nurse Holland, what happened? It probably would have sounded like an extremely vague question, but in the context of all, it was very obvious why I asked it. I was asking what happened to explain the chaos around me, because as soon as my ears stopped ringing and my body felt like my own again, I was able to notice everything else unraveling around me, and it did not offer a pleasant sight, nor comforting sounds. There was an alarm blaring in the background, so many people talking. Some voices were hushed and clinical, some were hysteric, and the cries and howls that filled the large subterranean laboratory where the cryosleep chambers were made me feel like I had woken up in the middle of a war. It should have been a simple question, but her face immediately turned concerned, and I was smart enough to guess I wouldn't get the full answer from her at that moment. We had to deal with a small and unforeseen technical emergency, she replied. It's nothing for you to worry about right now. I suppose she was right. It wasn't easy to search my cold and somnolent brain for memories of my past, and a headache was imminent. But I remember the instructions all the volunteers received right before we fell asleep. You'll wake up in a hundred years, they said. You'll receive the best medical attention we can provide and enjoy optimal conditions for your recovery for as long as you need. Then they told us you'll receive your share of the money and you'll be free to live the best life that the future can afford. With that deal in mind, I tried to relax. It was time for the medical examination. I had to answer a dozen questions about myself, my past, and the current state of my body, and then I could entertain myself by observing the technological improvements in the medical area. 
Everything was sleek and unfamiliar, and incredibly interesting to me. I watched Nurse Holland work for a while, and then, while she studied the results for a few minutes, I tried to get a good look at the rest of the huge laboratory. The cryosleep chambers were all lined along the walls and in front of each other. There was a sort of improvised infirmary where a nurse worked with each patient, just like Nurse Holland and me. But no, not everyone was like us. There were people moving frantically in all directions. Nurses, people in business suits, people dressed like soldiers. The stations to my left and my right looked perfectly normal, just like me. But beyond the next volunteer, to my right, the space was empty, save for a large pool of blood on the floor. The sight terrified me enough to make me look away, quickly, and wish that I hadn't seen that. What happened? Who bled that much? Why? Where did they go? For better or for worse, what I saw to my left was a distraction, but brought me many more questions. About three or four stations down the line, there seemed to be a fight. Not an argument, a big, violent, unforgiving fist fight. The kind of thing you know won't end until the participants are pulled apart and restrained or rendered unconscious. Who was fighting who? And why, I wondered. We've only been awake for minutes. What reason could a person have to fight another in just a minute of opening their eyes? All these questions, these doubts and uncertainty, quietly ripped a hole through my chest. It was the first time I experienced that feeling of emptiness, as if there was a void in my heart, deep enough to give me vertigo even though I was sitting somewhere completely safe. I was startled to suspect that the dizzy and cold feeling didn't come from my surroundings, but from deep within me. I had no idea what to do with it. I looked up at the nurse in front of me and weakly attempted to joke to clear my head. It's kind of hectic here, isn't it? Kind of makes me want to go back to sleep, I said and forced a smile for her sake. I wished I would have done better, but as I said the words, I had a feeling they were somewhat true. I longed to lay down and rest and turn off my overheated brain again. What had happened to the overwhelming joy of coming back to life? I was pulled out of my thoughts by a soft, oh, coming from the nurse. She looked back down to take notes of some secret meaning she found in my words. When she looked back up at me, she was wearing a similarly frail, but well-meaning smile. Well, Nancy, I am happy and honored to report that you are in very good physical condition, she said to me. We'll keep an eye on you and provide you with the basic package of vitamins, just to be sure. We can lead you to your room now. Right. Thank you, Nurse Holland, I said at least comforted by being part of a conversation, saying someone's name and looking into a woman's beautiful eyes again. But there was something that didn't feel right. This is a good thing, isn't it? I had to ask out loud, because something about her face made me feel like this wasn't exactly good news. She hesitated before speaking, and that only added to my spark of anxiety. The pressure at the bottom of my chest. Ideally, we wouldn't tell you anything yet. Nurse Holland said softly, busying herself with random medical tools to avoid meeting my eyes. But the situation is so delicate that we received instructions to fully inform all healthy subjects on the general conditions of the project so we can move on as fast as possible. Move on? Informers of what? I wondered. Can I explain as we make our way to your room? She asked and offered me her hand. I accepted Nurse Holland's hand and realized it was the first time I purposefully touched another person in a hundred years, not as a part of the medical examination, just for the sake of it. 
I felt surprisingly deep grief when she let go of my hand when we started walking. Fortunately, the hallways were so chaotic and the people moving around us were so hurried that, more often than not, Nurse Holland had to put her hand on my arm or my back to guide me through. The entire time, she explained the dire situation that we found ourselves in. She said, A hundred years ago, a group of enthusiastic and well-meaning people started this project, promising a million things they wouldn't be alive to see through. As you can see, the world didn't end. It didn't even fix itself. It just happened to go on and on. Things got better and worse, and then back again, and then here we are. There was progress, wars, improvements, economic crises, promises, contamination, all of it. And then somewhere along the way, we lost the investment in the hundred frozen bodies in some old building's basement. Don't get me wrong. This is still a historical moment, and I believe you're one of the most important people in the world right now. But not everyone agrees. We weren't prepared for... today. Most people working here are volunteers. Descendants of the original volunteers. We just want to help you guys... come back to us. I waited for a moment. Hoping she would say more, I could tell she was probably holding on to a lot of information. But if this was enough to make it feel like the floor was opening up and preparing to swallow me whole, then maybe I didn't need to know more just yet. I made the effort to smile again at her and asked, So, is this your way of telling me you're my great-granddaughter? Nurse Holland looked surprised for a second before remembering that a few minutes ago I told her I didn't have children before joining the project. Then she laughed, taken by surprise and seemingly delighted by it. No, not your great-granddaughter, she said, and almost successfully hid a painful look in her eyes. We arrived at my room, a small but functional little space inside the same building, a middle ground between a hospital room and a hotel room for the volunteers to stay in while they decided what to do with their fortunes and their new lives. Nurse Holland welcomed me into my room, explained all the futuristic appliances that I wasn't familiar with, showed me the red button I should press if I had an emergency, and then, just like that, she left me all alone, with one more of her small smiles. Part of me wished she would have been cold, Rude, heartless, anything that I wouldn't have missed so desperately and viscerally as soon as the door closed behind her. I tried to distract myself with all the novelties of the future, but one small room could get boring surprisingly quickly. No matter how much I could adjust the lights and the temperature and things like that, I tried to go to sleep, but this attempt was extremely short-lived for obvious reasons. I thought I'd never want to go back to sleep. There was nothing that unconsciousness could offer to me. Or at least, that's what I thought that first day. The solution to all these problems, to me, was obvious. I needed to get out of my room. I waited for as long as I could. Then, I opened my room's door slowly. Carefully. And I slipped outside. The hallways had considerably fewer people running through them but the few still going at it were too busy to pay attention to me. A couple of times I thought I would get lost, but to be fair, the trail of bloodstains on the floor and the stream of distressed people was a good guide to finding the main laboratory again. When I reached it, I instinctively knew it would be best if I tried to hide myself, discreetly moving from one abandoned station to the next, cowering behind shelves and examination tables if necessary avoiding people's eyes, anything to get closer and closer to the worst of it, to the spot where a large group of people were reunited. Most of the volunteers were gone, safe in the room like I should have been, but I couldn't help my curiosity. With the fewer people and less noise filling the giant room, 
the effect was much more dramatic. I could hear the echoes of footsteps. I could hear the bits and pieces of conversations. And, worst of all, I could perfectly hear the loud, angry, monstrous wail of a person in danger. How can you react to something like that? What was I supposed to do? Go back to my room? I needed to know more. I needed an explanation for the sudden cries, the warnings, and the tearful exclamations of everyone around. I stopped being so careful. I was convinced nobody would care about me. Not in the middle of that chaos. I moved forwards. I pushed past a group of strangers. I couldn't stop. And finally, I saw it. There were dozens of people in a circle. On the outside, people in biohazard suits were sweating and looked scared out of their minds. In the middle, many nurses with uniforms, stained with blood and God knows what else, with determined expressions on their faces, ready to help, even if the help they needed was brutal. The inner circle was a handful of tall and muscular men, with guns in their belts, but holding police sticks in their hands as they tried to reel in and control a... a man? beast? What the hell was that? I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. There was a man standing in the middle of the circle, but he wasn't like anything I had ever seen before. He towered over all of the other men. His bulging muscles that ripped through his clothes were unnaturally large. I was too far to get a good look at his eyes, but his expression didn't seem human at all. He was lost. He was feral. He was baring his blood-stained teeth, and he was drooling like a dog. I was horrified to look down at my own body, maybe less than half the size of his, and realize that we were wearing the exact same clothes. He was a volunteer, like me. I must have met him a hundred years ago. But something terrible and inhumane had changed in him in the meantime. Because none of those facts I noticed could compare to the most troubling of all. The fact that he was standing there, with his arms by his side. But in one hand he was holding another person by the neck. A broken neck. A limp body. He was holding a corpse in his hands, as if it was nothing. I'm not sure if I started to shake or cry or scream, but someone must have realized I was another one of the volunteers, and, well, from what I had just seen, we weren't exactly well regarded at that moment. In the eyes of these people, that monster, that mindless killer, and I were related now. All I know for sure is that at some point a pair of hands grabbed me and I came face to face with Nurse Holland again. I'm sorry. She told me. This is the protocol now. Very swiftly, she stuck some sort of syringe on my right arm, but I didn't have time to figure out what it was that she injected me with. Within a few seconds, I lost consciousness. For the first time in a hundred years, I woke up naturally. The problem was that I didn't want to wake up at all. That feeling of a dark pit opening up in my chest had taken hold of me, and it wasn't leaving. I felt like a void, with nothing but a cold breeze passing through me. I survived a hundred years of sleep. And for what? Money that I probably wouldn't even receive, because the Cryosleep Project was a charity run by volunteers now? For a family that's all dead and gone and I'll never see again? For a world that doesn't care about me? A community that turned into monstrous murderers. A future that wasn't mine to see in the first place. I had to sleep. I had to go back to sleep and I had to make sure I wouldn't wake up again. But I couldn't. I kept waking up. I kept opening my eyes. I kept tossing and turning in bed and needing the bathroom and eventually someone knocked on my door. I think I owe you an explanation. Nurse Holland told me, after she convinced me to get ready and go out to have breakfast. The kind nurse looked almost as tired as me. 
but if everything else in the world was troubling, her smile was a constant, a comfort, and a luxury. I worked hard to return the favour with a smile of my own, but it wasn't easy. She led me to a wide cafeteria, where volunteers, accompanied by their assigned nurse, ate breakfast along with the workers of the establishment. Then, Nurse Holland explained, You are among the lucky ones, Nancy. Even if it doesn't feel like it. Depression and trouble fitting in was expected, but there's more. There have been really unfortunate after-effects in some of the volunteers, and it was all worsened by the fact that... <sighs> Look, the Cryo Sleep Project was sabotaged. We bought off several sabotaging attempts throughout the years, but yesterday just... A religious group of fanatics, a sect that's not even as old as you are, technically. They got in. They vandalized the building and they ignited a malfunction in the system, resulting in all of you waking up ahead of time and under less than ideal circumstances. It's only been 96 years, Nancy. We improvised called as many people as possible and rushed here just in time, but we're only just starting to figure out just how the system malfunction affected the bodies of the survivors. We lost 30 lives because of the sabotage, and everyone awake is experiencing some problems. You saw the worst of it yesterday. What happened to him? I asked her, because I couldn't figure out anything else to say. I was numb. We couldn't save him. Nurse Holland, to her credit, told me the truth, and I was grateful for the lack of details. And what happens to me now? To the rest of us? I wondered, as I gave up on my breakfast halfway through. Well, you're all welcome to stay in your rooms for as long as you need. We're working on getting you the money you were all promised. Medical attention and checkups will be constant. We're also organizing support groups, so the survivors can connect with each other. There was a long silence as I searched my brain for something worthy to say. I knew I should have been shocked, angry, curious, distraught, or some burning and urgent emotion, but I couldn't find any of it inside of me. Instead, I looked into Nurse Holland's eyes and asked her, Who's your great-grandparents or whatever? We couldn't save her either, she answered. The next few days passed slowly. Or maybe they didn't. I didn't care enough to keep track of them. After a week, all the days started to look the same anyway. Nurse Holland worked as my caregiver most of the day, almost every day. She told me to start calling her Lucy, but I wasn't sure I deserved it. I was a terrible patient. I barely ate any food, and I only accepted my medicines because they didn't require any effort. I showered when she told me to, and I walked around the building when she held my hand, but on my own, the only thing I could do was try to sleep, and wish, desperately, not to wake up. I started going to the support groups, of course, but I couldn't remember meeting any of those people a hundred years ago, back when we weren't a charity case. We weren't monsters, we weren't ghosts of the people we used to be. Seeing the other volunteers didn't help me. If anything, I thought it was worsening my depression. The others were struggling so much more than me. I told myself I didn't care about them. I thought I was able to keep track of them only because, at night, when I couldn't sleep, thinking about them made me feel bad enough to make me want to kill myself. It resulted in awful nightmares. That, at least, would make me feel something other than emptiness, even if it was an ephemeral shot of adrenaline. There was David, who developed a rash on every inch of his skin, and it worsened every day. Sometimes he started to bleed during our group sessions. Sometimes he was covered all in bandages. And sometimes he couldn't be there because his skin was falling off. There was Veronica, who woke up from the failed cryosleep experiment 
pregnant. Inexplicably pregnant. Everyone was scared to find out what she was going to give birth to. Then there was Inai, who had scales appearing on her body. Elliot, whose eyes had quite simply disappeared while he slept. Yvonne, who was growing half an inch every day. Graham, whose teeth were starting to grow out of his jaw. Fifteen names of people that killed themselves within the first few months. And then there was me. Nancy Clayton. What can I say about myself? I was one of those supposedly lucky few that came out unscathed. With nothing wrong physically, no mutations, no mysterious diseases, and nothing but crippling depression. There was me, a politician nobody cared about, teachers and doctors that left big families behind, engineers and scientists that didn't understand the new world, a pathetic little group, as I used to think of us. We lived one day at a time and attended our sessions just like everyone else. I sat there and I listened to a celebrity brag about getting a book deal to share his story. I watched an 18 year old celebrate the new red tint of his skin because it was making him famous. I stepped in to break up several fights and I got into a few fights myself because it made me feel alive. It made Lucy put a bandage over the wounds every time. Sometimes that brought us much closer than just being another part of her job. I was so sure that I was a walking corpse, but... But there were people crying on my shoulder during our sessions. There were strangers waving at me in the cafeteria, and there was Lucy checking in with me every single day. We were sick and dying and becoming unrecognizable things, but I had to admit that it was starting to feel like something I remember calling home. One day, during one of the support group sessions, everything changed. One of us, halfway through a conversation, broke down into tears, which turned into wails, and then into animalistic groans. He broke out into a new monster, a creature of pure rage without reason and held us as hostages until security guards had to kill him right in front of our eyes. But I fought back, just like the others. We cried hysterically and rose from the floor, and attacked the guards, and tried at all costs to avenge our fallen friend. Our monster. Our brother. I screamed until I lost my voice. I cried for something other than myself, and I was kicked down like everyone else. But it was the very first time in a hundred years that I felt glad to be alive and to be able to do something. Of course, this was the excuse that the people in positions of power had been waiting for. The cryosleep project was deemed a failure. Nobody cared about us if we weren't making a profit or a spectacle of our transformed bodies and minds. We got kicked out of that old building and forced to join society without an ounce of the fortune we were promised. But the kindness never ran out. Most of the nurses took in the patients they worked with for months. I moved in with Lucy, and with time, smiling back at her became as easy as breathing. Very often we welcomed one of my old friends into our home. Sometimes a few. Sometimes our living room filled with people with strange bodies and terrible nightmares. Forgotten by the world, but never by their fellow volunteers. I realized that Lucy was right. The world didn't change. It didn't get any better or worse. But did it matter? In the grand scheme of things, the greed and cruelty of it could never compare to the small scale. The pure and simple feeling of knowing you have a family that loves you. I thought I lost mine a hundred years ago. But there I was. Living proof that as long as there were people alive, some of us would always choose kindness and solidarity with each other. Hey sci-fi horror fans, it's Kira Rhodes. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the amazing VAs that helped with the production of this video. You can find their links in the description. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you'd like to become an official member of our channel, you can do so by clicking on the join button. Membership starts at $5 only, and remember, stay cosmic!